you want to kneel, if you want to stand and lift your hands, um, this song is a, a prayer and a declaration, uh, deciding that we will make room for what it is that God has for us. Um, when I was growing up, my favorite Bible verse was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and it says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and to acknowledge God in all of your ways and he will make your path straight. Um, that verse has continued to become more and more alive in my life as I've lived more years. Um, and, it, and it's really challenging. I thought, I thought it was my favorite when I was their age, the B students, but whoo, to trust in the Lord with all my heart in all areas, finances, my health, my marriage, parenting, my job, Jesus, all of them? To say that his way is better than mine? Woo! That's surrender. Hmm. That's hard. But God, your way is better. Oh, yeah. 
it like this. This might be familiar to some of us. Oh, but we can sing. And so today we're going to continue and still talking about being unburdened through breakout. But, you know, this uh, our time together is inspired because I was uh, in a conversation with my my daughters. And actually before that, I was reading the Times. Right. I was reading the Times and I came across this article where I was talking about how as Californians, uh, we pay on average one hundred dollars more for groceries than any other state in the country. Right. Some of y'all probably like, oh, yeah, I knew that. OK, because <laughs> like, you see it every time you go into your grocery store. Right. And but on average, it's like one hundred and thirty six, one hundred and fifty six Californians pay uh, more in groceries. Right. Than any other state um, in the country. And then I was talking with my daughters because I was talking about the Great Depression. Right. And I was talking I was telling about, the, you know, the, the 30s and the, the 1930s. And, and I said, do you think they called it the Great Day, the Great Depression when they were living in it? You know, and I was like, they didn't, right? They were living in the Great Depression, but they didn't call it the Great Depression. That didn't come till hindsight, years later. I said, you know, one day when, when you were like, when you get to college probably or something like that, you're going to hear about how this economy and during this time, it's going to have some sort of name. You know, we don't, I don't know what it is because I was talking to them about it because they was asking for, you know, eating out, five, you know, this and that every day and stuff like that. I'm like, I got to put it to you straight. Listen. OK. And I heard I think I think prices in out to uh, out to eat food is going up again in April, you know, um, for the state of California. So again. Right. And so I was talking to them and I'm like, I don't know what it's going to be called. It might be called the, the, the wallet wobble. I don't know. It's like, you know, it, we need a dance. I was like, come up with a dance. Be students about the wallet wobble, because that's what's going to shake this time. That's what it's talking about. Or it might be called like the, the Cash Crunch Chronicles. I don't know what they're going to call it. Maybe it's called the Money Mountain Decade. But either way, I was talking to them about, no, there is a strain in the economy. And that means there's a strain on how life is lived. And so today, and so that just got me. And so I know from that, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm thinking about money. You know, I'm thinking about, okay, this year, I'm thinking about, okay, how do I get my affairs in order, my finances in order so that I can still love and so I can still give, so I can still do the things that my family is called to do. And I'm like, and I know the state of California is thinking about money. The country is thinking about money. I mean, how many, when you go through your social feed, you see, you know, all the different feeds that talk about, you know, hey, when is this, that says something about the economy. Right. And so I know for a fact that uh, money is a part of maybe what many of us are thinking about. And as we go into this new year, this is another area of focus for our time tonight. We have to become unburdened through breakout. And I'm calling this our finance edition, the money edition, because it's about how we need breakout um, from what we can be held under in, held under by. 
And so this admittedly, this is a very taboo topic, money, you know, and I, if I could choose anything to talk about or preach about, one of the three most taboo things to ever preach about, well, one is sex, okay? The second one is money, especially in the church, very taboo, okay? Don't talk about it. And so and this is very taboo, right? And then another one is just religion, right? And that's just like how we understand other faith religions, other world religions, um, other faith systems. And so tonight, but we got to go there. Why? Because th we got to get unburdened. Listen, I'm telling if it ain't for you, it's going to be for me that I got to go in this year ready. OK, Lord, how are how are you preparing me? How can I be prepared right to go through my family, go with my family through this year? Right. So that's where we're landing on tonight, because it's still a part of how we as uh, followers of Jesus really learn to be whole and healed and joyous and free. It is one how we relate to money. So that's what we're going to be talking about in the few minutes we have together. I'm going to kind of, forgive me, I'm going to talk a little fast because I have some great things. I'm so excited. I've been waiting, been waiting to get to this time to share with you all what God has given me. And so, like I said, this sermon really is about breakout. It's about breakout and it's about a reevaluation, about making mid-course corrections to our relationship with money and possessions. And so the question that sits at the base of what we're talking about really is this. How do I relate to money? You know, that's a question that I had to answer for myself. How, how is it that I relate to money? You see, and so therefore, really, when we're talking about this, when we're talking about this question, money is significant for us because money has to do with family. It has to do with children. It has to do with the future, your future. It has to do with war, government, politics, economics, and it even has to do with the call of God on your life, on our lives. So I want to just kind of open up then with a, I was also reading in the New York Times, there's a New York Times bestselling author, his name is Randy Alcorn, right? Um, and he just began, and I want to share this with you, he describes money as this, if you go to the next slide, he describes money, is, he says money is a pledge of assets, all right? He says money is a pledge of assets, when you have money, uh, in, it, is, you are, it is a pledge toward an asset. Um, and then we're going to get to what the function of money is. But money is a pledge of assets, this New York Times bestselling author says. And he does also happen to be a Christian um, author. Um, and then he goes to also talk about in this book, which is really important for us today, is that money really is a morally neutral topic. It's interesting because it's very taboo. <laughs> but, you see, it is a morally neutral topic. One in which that it can be used for good and it can be used for evil. And so we as Christians and trying to follow Jesus, right? It is important for us to think wisely about how is it that I relate to money, right? Because money can be used as an instrument of good. Like it can feed, it can clothe, it can provide shelter, medicine, it can translate Bibles. It can do a, a, a whole host of good things, right? Um, but money can also be an instrument of evil, it can buy a person who's being trafficked. It can bribe a judge. It can fund terrorist acts. You see, what am I saying about this? M money is morally neutral. So what does this mean? It means that money, because money is morally neutral, it's not about money being good or bad, but it is because it has a vast potential. It is about the one who gives and utilizes money and how we relate to money that determines whether that money is good or evil. Y'all with me, right? All right. So there's an Oxford professor. If you go to the next slide, um, because I love reading uh, 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 him his books. His name is Andrew Briggs. He actually teaches physics, but um, he wrote a book called It Keeps Me Seeking um, out of Oxford. And then he talks about this and he's talking about Jesus and I'm um, talking about Jesus teaching about money and through the scriptures. And he says, Jesus talks an awful lot about money and there are various ways of thinking what money does. Pause there. Um, so Jesus, the New Testament speaks a lot about money. I mean, more than hell. Uh, I mean, he speaks a lot about money. And so as followers of Jesus, knowing that one money is neutral and that Jesus actually has a mind, there's a heart of, of God about how we relate to money, it's important. So thinking what money does, continuing, Andrew Briggs says, one of the things it does, so how money functions, it, is an, it enacts a way of distributing and controlling resources. So that's just the function of money. One, we know money, it is, it's a holder of assets. Well, how does it function? Well, it, it distributes, right, and controls resources. So that's the purpose and the function of money. But therefore, the word money, as we see, it cannot be abandoned 
in the Christian spirituality just because it's been dirtied, just because it also has been manipulated and abused by so many. Oh, my goodness. And it has done that. So because of the spiritual warfare that surrounds this taboo subject of money and possessions, if this message really is to be received with eternal gain and a benefit for your year, a benefit for our year, no matter what you're going through in your life, if it's to be received as a benefit for you, we have to do it prayerfully, right? And so that's what we're going to be doing. And so Jesus calls us to be fruitful in John 15. And fruitful is an overarching way of talking about of bearing fruit, right? Of, of growing, of also maintaining, um, ma maintaining things that you need or things that you uh, require for mission, for what God has given you and mission in your life. And so what we're going to do, we're going to talk to three points about one, how we, right? Okay, how we can become unburdened by the by unburdened through breakthrough as we reinvent reinvest excuse me but refocus on how we relate to money all right so the first one we're gonna have to do um go to the next slide for me if you can joe so let's see what that is uh because oh yeah so the first slide point number one though is we got to make room for god so that this number one we got to make room for god as we think about, well, how is it that we relate to money and to relate well as, and to money? And I say money a lot. I'm talking about money and possessions. OK, it is we have to we have to make room for God. That's the first thing we have to do. First one. So I wrote down some questions because just to kind of get you started. Right. Because when I even talk about money now or say what kind of things comes up in your soul, in your mind, in your spirit? Right. And so just some questions to get you thinking about how is it that you honestly relate to money today as we go into this year. So did your parents ever talk to you about money? You know, it's just questions. Just kind of be thinking about because these are things that form how we often think about money and whether it's we use it for good or we use it for evil. Um, did your parents ever talk to you about money? Have you ever talked to your parents or your kids about money? You know, maybe have you ever had a conversation with your parents? Uh, for those of you who have kids, talk to them if they're at the right age, you know, about money and what it's used for and how to use it well and with wisdom, right? Um, if you have money, how do you spend it? Uh, do you cling to it in case of emergencies? Is that how you relate to money? Do you give money to friends or institutions? Do you relate to money in that way? Are you concerned whether gifts are tax deductible? Is that a way you relate to money? Next slide for me. Another more questions. Well, how does having money or not affect your self-esteem? You know, it says, how do you relate to money? Uh, do you feel good when you have a lot? Do you feel good? Yeah, listen, come on. <laughs> it's like, it, it does something to you, right? It's like, oh man, I'm good now. I'm good. Like, you know, it, it does something, right? But we as followers of Jesus, right, we have to get repositioned. Okay, going into 2024, right, and being unburdened through breakthrough. Um, how does money affect our self-esteem? And do we have to bring this before God? Because what we're talking about is making room for God. That's the song we just sung, too, before this. I will make room for you. Are we ready to make room for God? But continuing, do you feel not as good when you say, I don't have money? You know, <laughs> do you feel not as good when you say, I don't have money? Uh, do you use money to control people or events? Next slide. So these are just questions, right? Uh, next slide. Uh, so do you use financial resources to make sure something happens your way? Is that how you relate to money? Or have you ever used money to simply give others the freedom to do what they want to do? And that is you saying like, you know, I don't care how you spend it, I just want you to have it. Have you ever done that to someone? Again, that's an internal rhetorical question. How is it that you relate to money? How would you feel if someone asked you for $1,000? And, and even more, you know, what if someone says to you, you know, I know you have $1,000, you know, can I have $1,000? And that was a different spin on it, you know? And so, I, and, and it's been incredibly, this is how I feel often when I go to McDonald's or I'm in Sprouts, or I go to the grocery store and I'm paying for my food. And they say, would you like to just add up to the nearest dollar and give to such and such agency? I say, because you know I got it because I just spent 40, $50 in gro listen, groceries, $150 on groceries. So you know I got 60 cents. You know I got it. 
But what do I say? You know, not this time. <laughs> not this time. <laughs> Listen, and I'm not this time. There's an incredible, incredible, um, incredible professor. His name is Miroslav Volf. Used to teach at Fuller, now teaches at Yale. He wrote a book called Free of Charge. And I put that thing on the bottom of your handout. Excellent book on, on how to give, right? And how to think about that as faithful Christians. Because you got to know, one, we are not God, so we cannot give like God who has eternal giving. So I feel just fine when I tell Mrs. Sprouts, no, not this time. You know what I'm saying? Because you can't give everything. Everyone has to be wise about when you give, about how we utilize money, right? And so it's just not the Christian thing to do. And so, but what if someone, again, said that? So these are just questions that awaken us, you know, about like how we feel about money. And so, but the question that it really gets at really is where is your security base? Is it in God or is it in money? Is it in God or is it in money? And that's what we're really trying to get at you know, about where our security base is. And there's a guy named A.W. Tozer. If you can go to that slide, he says this as he's talking about money and about how we can handle money. Is, is it the next slide? Do I have that? Oh, I don't think I put that on there, huh? Oh, my goodness. So you just got to listen to me. A.W. Tozer, right? He says this. He says, the man of pseudo faith, and he wrote in the 19th century, so he uses man to refer to all humanity, to both men and women. And he says, the man of pseudo faith, just a little bit of faith, will fight for his faith but refuse flatly to allow himself to get into a predicament where his future must depend upon that faith being true. Now, I mean, and that's, I can see all the Bible thumpers today on social media. You, you all ride or die about the Bible, all ride or die about the faith and what God did and stuff like that. But once it comes actually to like, actually put your faith on the line to risk something by taking a step toward doing something dangerous and risky that God is calling you to do, where now it's like, oh, I'm on the back seat. You see what I'm saying? And this is what Tozer is talking about. He says, and he continues to say, he always, the, the man, that kind of person always provides himself with secondary ways of escape so he will have a way out if the roof caves in. What we need very badly these days is a company of Christians who are prepared to trust God as completely now as they know they must do on the last day. So that just hit me. You know, Tozer does that a lot, though. Um, and so it just hit me because uh, what's your secondary plan? And do we often treat this, our security being in money as our secondary plan, just in case God don't come through this, this year, just in case God don't open up this year. You know, we got our secondary plan. You see, and so I've been watching as we're about to jump into a text. I've been uh, watching, y'all watch uh, Jack Reacher on Amazon. Go to the next slide for me, right? So Jack Reacher on Amazon, anybody, if you're not watching, listen, I ain't going to give it all away. But it's a really good series, okay, on Prime, a good series. The second season dropped like a couple weeks ago, and I'm done with the whole second season. But in this show, it's interesting, right? Because in this show, one of the villains um, in the series is doing all this evil, um, and one of the, pers the people describe about this villain, in the so he says, you know what? God is his money, and that's why he's doing it all. And this is what they say kind of toward the end of the series. And so it's one of his associates of the villain that recognizes all this mess uh, that's happening is because of someone making money their God. And then in contrast to the bad guys, you got Jack Reacher. He's the good guy, right? And one of the associates says in the last series, in the last episode of the season, one of the people, they describe Jack Reacher and they describe him by saying, he wanders the earth with nothing in his pockets except a toothbrush. He's got it all figured out. And if you've been watching Jack Reacher, you kind of, you kind of, you make those connections, you know, but Jack Reacher, he just goes around. He doesn't have anything to his name. He just walks around and he's doing good, right? But here we got Amazon Prime talking in their show. The whole underbelly of the show is what happens when in a world that looks like when people make money, they're God, and they put John Reacher then as this hero. But what is this not anything about this hero? This hero does not have money as his God. In fact, he has really kind of let go of a lot of possessions. And so this is a story, but Amazon doesn't go as far to say he's depending on God, but it does go far. To, it does go to set up the contrast of what can happen when we don't relate to money well. This is what Bezos is doing. So when we come then to our text today, we're, we're talking about a familiar, a familiar text in Matthew chapter 19. All right, Matthew chapter 19. And I have the passage for you on your handout there because Jesus is coming to a young, uh, what I call a young professional. 
Jesus comes to a young professional and he's asking this young professional about what's going on. All right. So it's Matthew chapter 19 and it's the verse, verse 16. I'm going to skip around a little bit as we talk and as we walk through it. OK, um, so I don't have all the all the verses here on the uh, the screen, but but this is what he says. So Jesus comes to this this young professional in verse 16. It says let's see here. Yeah. So just then. A man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You know, all the big 10. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. And then this young professional says, all these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? And in verse 21, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, which really means complete, if you want to be whole, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Gosh, you know, just stabs me sometimes. This is why I don't like the Bible sometimes. And it's okay not to like the Bible sometimes. The Bible's not always going to agree with you. It's not supposed to agree with everything you feel and want. That's why it's called God's word and not Brandon's word, right? And not Nair's word or not Christina's word. It's God's word because it's not supposed to always agree with what you want to do. Right. And so we, we're invited to reflect on how we make room for God. And so I'm reading this. Right. And so oftentimes, though, I will say this story is usually thought to be one about Jesus's criticism of wealth and possessions as a system. But a careful reading of this passage renders um, a different kind of rightful exegesis of the text. And so what we see here is a hardworking, young, professional, young man. And he says and so when, when, when uh, this young man says, I, I, how do I get eternal life? You know, how do I walk with you, God? How do I kind of have my life together? Jesus says, you know, do the big 10. He says, I did that. Um, and then he says, well, you got to go sell all your possessions. Well, notice Jesus doesn't say to him, because Jesus says, go sell all your possessions. He doesn't say, just give 10% to the poor. You see, if this was a young, if this was a good Jew, he, one, he would have already been doing that. And so based off Old Testament instruction, but instead Jesus tells him to give up everything and follow the Lord. And what we see in response is how this hardworking professional relates to money and to possessions. Because what does it say that he did? He went away what? He went away sad. He went away sad. You see, when we actually look throughout the rest of the new, the whole of the New Testament, we, it's actually pretty clear that Jesus did not and does not call all of his disciples to liquidate their possessions yeah. or give away my microphone. You know, that's my fault because uh, I didn't change the pattern. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do yellow. I'm gonna do yellow tomorrow. Oh yeah, this is. Oh, you can give me yours. That'd be great. Oh, this works perfect. You see. Um, and so what we see is that throughout the, Jesus did not and does not call all his disciples to liquidate their bank accounts, to sell all his possessions. Jesus doesn't do that to everyone he comes across. So, and, and doesn't ask him, he doesn't ask everyone to leave home. Oh, yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. And so, but we see that Jesus is asking this millennial, this Gen Zer, right? Like there's something going on in his life. There is something going on in his life. Jesus knows that money has become his God. And so what has become your God today, friends? As you just think about your life, it may not be money. It may be power. It may be position. It may be status. But this year, you have a purpose and a destiny in becoming unburdened. Now, this we got to change the batteries in this one. Forgive me, Lord. Listen. <laughs> Oh my goodness, we're going to do yellow. We're going to do yellow. I'm sorry, y'all. But listen, well, what, is, what have you made a God in your life this year? Because this year is about becoming unburdened through breakout so that you can live whole, free, joyous, and at peace. But you got to break out from the hold of the counterfeit gods. You got to break out from the hold of the things that have you that are not allowing you to make room for the Lord. 
We've got to clear out our closet of counterfeit gods, those things that are really just getting in the way of the ways you know God has been trying to get your attention. So that's number one. We've got to make room for God. We got, and, and that means not the little gods, not the little Gs. And we, we all got them to a certain extent. But in 2024, if you want to go into your breakout and you want to break out to do the things that God has called you to do, just put God to the test and begin to let those little G gods go slowly leave your life. Ask God to replace them with himself and he will fill them as you make room for him. And one of those things for us as Americans, one of those things for us as human beings may just be money. So that's number one, make room for God. Number two, uh, we got to adopt the principle of fruitfulness. Oh my goodness. We got to adopt the principle of fruitfulness. And so for this one, for this one, and I have that, I do have those slides there too, where it's those, those points are there. And, and as you adopt the principle of fruitfulness, it's going to come from this one, a very familiar passage in Matthew 25. And you're probably familiar with the parable of the talents, right? And so the central crux of this thing, and I just want to read it to you a little briefly, right? Because it says, for it will be like a man going on a journey. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. And he says, uh, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. And I have a few of these verses on your handout. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, to another one talent, right? Um, and to each according to his ability. So they each had according to their ability, what they were able to manage and to steward. Then the master went away. And so also he had the two talents, made two talents more. He who had five made five more talents, verse 18. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled, um, and settled their accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. And if you just track with me, you know, that same thing happens to the, to the servant who had two talents. He says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And though to the servant who didn't utilize what God had given him well, uh, God, uh, the master says to him, I mean, what have you done? You know, like you got to get out of here. You got to get, you got to get away from me because I, I gave you something to utilize it, to be of good courage with it. And so, but what we want to focus on, on this adopting the principle of fruitfulness is what Jesus tells the servants who utilize well what God gives. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Can we go back a couple, please? Go back a couple slides to just well done. So where it says well done, this is the principle right here. One of fruitfulness, well done. When Jesus says, well done, he's telling his servant, you have executed the mission. You've done it well. And so it actually does matter to God that we are successful, that we are effective with the resources God has given us, with the possessions that God has given us. He says, well done. That's Jesus's words, right? So you execute the mission to you were seeking to be effective. Are you ready to seek to be effective this year with the resources God has given you, whatever that may be? Whatever it may be, are you ready to seek and be a, to seek effect, um, effectiveness with what God has given you to do? And that's what Joshua 1 8 is all about as well. When he says, meditate on the word day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, so that you, and so, and then it goes on to say, then your way will be prosperous and successful. And success and prosperity in the Old Testament means you, you met the mission. That's what success and prosperity in the Old Testament means. It means you, you, you did the job. So for us this year, as we think about how we relate to money, one of those ways we have to relate, we have to be willing to be effective with the money that God has given, the money that God has allowed us to have, whether it be little or whether it be much. All right, so we gotta be well done. Well, what's the next thing Jesus tells the servant? Go to the next slide. He says, well done, good, huh? So what does he say, what does he call him? Good. And this is about making moral choices, good moral choices and decisions with what God has given them to do. So if you're looking this year, right, to relate to money well and to grow and to grow spiritually with how you utilize money, how you spend, how you save, however it is you do with money, we have to not just be effective, but we got to be good with it. We got to have some good moral decisions behind how our money is spent. Because I told you, money is neutral. It's about how we utilize it that makes it either evil or good. Are y'all with me? 
All right, so this year is about being unburdened through breakthrough because we gotta make some good decisions. And let me tell you something about grace and about God. Grace is so amazing and God is so amazing, but God and grace won't make decisions for you. God will guide you. Oh my goodness, he's a guider. You see, grace will also provide a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance, but they won't make the decision for us. We have to make the decisions, and that's why Jesus calls the servant good, because he made good moral choices. So we have to get that. That is a part of this principle of what it means to be fruitful with things that God has called us to do. And did you know there's probably a passage in Luke that you may have even never heard about? And it's in Luke chapter 16. There was not enough room on your handout, and I don't have it in the slides, but write it down. Read it this week. Luke 16, verses 9 through 15. Listen what it says. This is what Jesus talks about. This is what Jesus is talking to his disciples about as it relates to making good choices with wealth, with possessions and money. And in verse 9, Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, I wish I could really exegete that verse, but I want you to keep listening. All right. Verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worth, um, worldly wealth, these are Jesus' words in Luke. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Verse 13, no one can serve two masters, Jesus says. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And then verse 14 says, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. Men and women, friends, let me tell you, as we prepare ourselves for this year, 2024, and we are in where groceries, we're paying, we paying a C-No plus. Okay, then Arizonans, listen, Massachusetts, we're paying more, all right? There's going to be less in your pockets, most likely. There's going to be less that you had to do with last year or years to come. But we have to be one. We can be bold and we can be courageous. And that doesn't mean we cower. And that don't mean we also live our life in complaint. It means that we trust the Lord. Well, what does he say? We have to be good. We have to make good choices with the resources we have. And this is what Jesus is teaching us, my friends. So not only do we have to go be well done, but good, but this is the last thing Jesus says in this principle of fruitfulness. He says, well done, a good and faithful servant. Let me tell you something. In your life and in your career this year, you got to keep God as true north. Keep the Lord as your true north. There's going to be things I want you to go to the left or to the right, but keep God as true north. So Jesus said to this, um, to the servant, I'm going to give you much responsibility over much. You know, the things that you've been asking or not just asking for, excuse me. I'm going to give you responsibility over much. Why? Because you walked with me, son. Daughter, you stayed with me. And so this year for us here at Beyond Church, are you ready to be well done with your resources, with your money and your possessions? Are you ready to make good choices with your possessions? Are you ready to be faithful to the Lord with your possessions? This is the principle of fruitfulness because this is what Jesus is saying to the servant. I am now going to give you responsibility over much. But this is so which one of these are you maybe not doing the best at this so far? And you just say, you think about it rhetorically. Which one are you saying, God, I, I need to grow in this one? You know, I, I need to grow in being effective, making sure I got a budget, making sure I, things are going right where they need to be. I, I'm being good moral choices. I'm not using my money for evil, but I'm, I'm using it for good, right? I'm using my money for good. Is that one you need to work on? Or, or is it just being faithful, not doubting God when things don't work out your way or when things are not coming together the way you thought they were going to come together? Will you be a faithful servant? So one, we got to make room for God, my friends. And then we have to adopt this principle of fruitfulness that Jesus gives us from the scriptures of, of his servants. And then I just want to leave you with this last one. We have to be anchored in the secret of living. You know, anchored in the secret of living. we got to anchor ourselves. So to relate to money and possessions, 
well this year. We gotta make room for God, not little G gods. We gotta adopt the principle of faithfulness and we gotta anchor in the, secure of li the, the secret of living. One time Anissa and I, we were with um, some premarital couples. We've been married, we're celebrating 15 years this year. Thank you Lord Jesus, right? I'm so grateful. And we were with a premarital class um, and we were on a part of the panel, right? And so on, on this panel, um, and this particular day in this class, it was on finances, about how to talk you know, to couples about finances. And they had great wise people, uh, you know, like CPAs and accountants on the panel. And then it was just me and this one, like, you know, I'm just, we just been married at the time for, you know, a number of years and, you know, ain't nothing special about us. We were just there to encourage couples. And, and it was tremendous wisdom, right, that um, was being shared on that stage. But I remember uh, looking down and talking to the couples, and I said, you know, and we we're both talking about it. I was like, there's some of you, though, as much all the wisdom that's being shared about how you keep an IRA and how you turn this around and plan for your time and all wise things. But there are people in this room, you may not have a retirement because God ain't, you might be a missionary until the day you die. You know, you might have to be, you might, your, a part of your mission in life might be to put your life on display in ways that you don't think is possible now. But ultimately, what I want you to do is trust the Lord. With wisdom is so important, we need to utilize wisdom to manage resources. But we have to keep God as our true north. Got to keep God as our true north. And so then as we anchor in the secret of living, I want to focus, I want to prepare to you, uh, prepare for you Philippians chapter four. And I want to invite the worship team to come on up as well, because as we talked about being fruitful, you know, living a fruitful life doesn't always mean that you're going to have the resources or the possessions or the money you need when you want it. Being fruitful doesn't mean that God is some. We kind of treat God sometimes like a, a, God, a Santa Claus, that God is just up like for this bringing gifts. And then he just brings those gifts and that's just it. You know, it's all oh, he brought the gifts. So it's here in its own time. But we sometimes treat God like a Santa Claus God, you know, or like a cosmic vending machine. We just if we say something right or we get the right note in our voice and then we can or do something right, then we push the right button on the machine. So now coming out, it's just going to be, you know, what we wanted. You see, no, that's not what Jesus teaches us about the Father in heaven, about the living God of the Bible. And so, but there is something Jesus teaches us that we see in his word today that allows us to break out so that we can be prepared financially to do what God is calling us to do this year for your family, for your relationship, for your household. And that's bound in Philippians chapter 4, right? Philippians chapter 4. And this is what it says in verse 11. You might be even familiar. I remember, I memorized this verse just kind of growing up, you know. And it says, not that I, and I memorized in a different version, I think. But not that I speak in regard to need. I have learned to be content. Whether I have little, or whether I have much. I have learned to be content. And so the, the NLT puts it, not that I was ever in need. For I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live in almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation. Hold right there. Oh my goodness. As you know, I'm, I'm sharing this for us as a church community because we are going to need this for this year. As prices go up and as people continue to talk about money and the economy on the headlines, the question is, will you be afraid? The question is, will you squander and wander and get all confused and I don't know what to do? Will you do it? Not the baptized, I tell you. that that is not our purpose and our destiny. But our purpose and destiny is to be content, whether we have little or whether we have much. And then he says, there's a secret of living in every situation. My goodness. Well, what is that secret, God? What is this secret thing that, that is about living content? In every situation, God, have you seen that I have more bills on my table than money in the bank? There are more days in the month than there are dollars on my chin. There are There is more mouths to feed than there is food in the cabinet. These are real everyday challenges that people of God, that people who follow God deal with all the time. This is our reality. And the circumstances is this. Jesus is inviting us into the secret of living in that situation. Think about your year. Think about what's coming up. Things are going to be tighter. It's going to be tighter for my family, without a doubt. Without a doubt. But what's the secret 
to waking up with a smile, to getting up in the morning and not letting it keep you down, to pursuing and keeping going on that mission so that you can be successful and prosperous in all the things God has called you to do. What's the secret? He says this, the secret of living in every situation, the next slide is this. The next slide for me, please, Joseph. There we are. The secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Oh my gosh. Isn't that worthy of praise? You're thinking about your career. You're thinking about your project. You're thinking about the things that God has called you to do. And God will equip you for mission. Whether that mission requires little, whether that mission requires much, whether that mission requires resources, which it very well may. God will provide it. Are you willing to make room for him today? Not the little G gods. Not don't make money. Don't make money the God. But are you ready to make room for him? I want to invite us all to stand on our feet right now. Are you ready to make room for him? And then, are you ready to adopt that, what it means to be fruitful, to be effective with what God has given you? Are you ready to make good choices with what God has given you? Are you ready to have your true north? You know, and then he says, as you depend on Christ, he's going to make, he's going to get you through it. He's going to provide in ways you did not think possible. He's going to come through in times when you thought this was the last minute. There was no more time. It's the 11th hour. Has anybody ever experienced God coming through in the 11th hour? Oh, yes. I've experienced the breakthrough of God in my life, in my own finances, when I said, God, I'm going to trust you. And so today, as an action step, I want to encourage you, and for us this year, so that as followers of Jesus, we don't got to grieve like the world grieves. We don't have to mourn like all Californians are going to be mourning. We got to be one ready. That means this month, we got to create a budget. If you don't got one, you need to create a budget. That's well done. Hello, somebody. Create a budget. Have it done by the end of January, early February. Then adjust the budget with contentment. There might be some things you cannot do, right? But don't, don't let it get you down. Don't let it make you sad or cry. Oh, he is going to perform this good work in me. And Christ is going to strengthen me through the great secret. I have contentment with the adjustments. Can I get an amen? amen. You can have contentment in the adjustments. And then thirdly, as an action step, I would encourage you to prioritize your spirituality of fruitfulness in your budget. How are you going to love God? How are you going to give and be generous? You have to include that in your budget. You see, these are ways that we produce fruitfulness in our lives. And here at Beyond Church, one of our values is, is um, transformational generosity. And so we believe here, we don't give begrudgingly here. We don't give out of force. We give because we know there is something God is doing in us in my mind when I let go of that little G. He's doing something in my wallet. When we're going to do the wallet wobble, I'm going to ask the peace student to come up with a dance. The wallet wobble all year long. Why? Because God is doing something in me as I give to the church, as I give and be generous to those who I see. But you got to prioritize fruitfulness in your budget. And so if that's you, if you're, and if you just, if that, you just need to make that testimony today, you're in a good place and in good company, because that's me. As our singers come, you can grab a red few, please, to there as well. And in this song, we're just going to reorient our eyes and our heart to say, God, I look to you. Yeah. I know where my help comes from. And so I'm not going to look to the side, to the left or to the right, but I'm going to look to him as we sing.